The story begins as we see that a half-naked masked man just defeated a monster. A creepy girl that probably had a few too many energy drinks watched nearby and celebrates that the Dark Lord was defeated. The Lookador looking guy proudly watches as the beast vanishes and the sun emerges from behind the clouds. His name is Sun Raku and the weird girl once again praises the warrior. She points out how it's been a long hard journey and Sun Raku couldn't agree more. Sun Raku then surprisingly takes to the sky and exclaims that it's time for Feria to go with the Dark Lord. He then does her a huge favor by rearranging her hideous face with his foot and tells her that she's the real menace in this world. We see that Sun Raku was actually in a game, he proudly proclaims that he finally beat it and also managed to get revenge for everything that Gargoyle put him through. In this world, display-based games are considered retro and fully immersive VR games have become the norm. Beneath the small number of works of significance lies a massive pile of releases whose game's designs don't live up to their improved graphics technology. These games are known as trash games, although most people rightfully despise trash games. There are those who gleefully seek them out and these people are called freaks. Our protagonist named Rakuro is one of these freaks and he proclaims that rumors were true and the game he just played was a giant pile of garbage. Rakuro compares the feeling he gets from beating a trash game to how a convict feels when finishing up her prison sentence. This psycho then wonders what trash game he will try next and we learn that he is known as the trash game hunter. When he heads downstairs we learn that his mom is kind of a weirdo too, as Rakuro tells her that one of her butterflies got out. At school, some random girl stalks Rakuro and practices what she plans to say to him. She decides to ask about video games and waits for the perfect moment but some other kid beats her to it. At a game shop, the owner named Mana Iwamaki hopes that summer vacation will help bring her more business. Rikuro's stalker named Rei Saiga arrives at the shop. Mana knows exactly why she is there but tells Rei that Rikuro isn't there today. Rei is too shy to admit to it but Mana points out how nice it must be to be young and in love. Mana explains that Rikuro has been busy trying to crack an extra special trash game so he hasn't been there in a while. She shows her the game called Furia Chronicle Online. It states that it's a legendary trash game. All the allies in the game have terrible AI. Enemy attack patterns don't make any sense and there are an absurd number of bugs in the code. The game is also extremely hard. Serious skills are needed even just to beat the first boss, so it has caused tons of players to rage out of control throwing their headsets like lunatic degenerates. On top of all that, she has also heard that players have to fight the final boss and board shorts and a mask. Just then Rakuro arrives looking for any new trash games that might have come out. He makes his way to the counter and we learn that Rei is an absolute coward as she instantly disappears. Mana is shocked to see him there and Rakuro proudly announces that he beat Fera Chronicle online. Rei watches from around the corner like the stalker she is and hears Rakuro explain that the game was a spectacular pile of garbage. The worst part about it was the female lead Feria, she's the cause of pretty much every problem he ran into on the journey. She makes every situation worse and gets villagers and party members killed. She also never suffered any consequences for anything since you would always find a way to blame it all in the last boss. Even though the boss didn't do anything and she was a problem all along, Rakuro continues to trash the trash game as he explains that if he ever gave Feria even the tiniest little shove to vent his annoyance she would just get upset. She would not go with them anywhere and refuse to move the story along. The autosave word document to the state of affairs and it would take 3 hours to get back in the cycle's good graces. Man is surprised that he didn't just give up which makes sense since he would be able to get an actual life but he explains that that's how they get you. In the 3 minutes between beating the final boss and before the credits start rolling, you can beat the snot out of the crazy girl without fear of retaliation. Rakuro points out the irony since the more Furia annoys you, the more determined you become to brave all the garbage to experience the 3 minutes of heaven. This guy clearly takes trash games way too seriously as he states that when that moment of bliss finally comes, it's as if all his frustrations are wiped away. In that moment, he felt like he understood why he was put on this earth. For some reason, Rei is smiling like a creep while hearing this and Rakuro explains that the trash game was too good. Now he can't think of what to follow it up with. Mana comes up with the absurd idea to not play a trash game for once. She explains that experiencing the lows in life can help appreciate the highs but the reverse is also true. Mana then introduces him to the game Shangri-La Frontier, the fully immersive VR game with over 30 million players. She continues to convince them and gives Rei a not so subtle wink for some reason. She explains that it can be fun to try things designed for mass appeal now and then, Rikuro seems to give it some serious thought. Back home we find that Rikuro's dedication to his gaming experience reaches dangerously high nerd levels as he studies the history of the game. 
He finds that Shangri-La Frontier aka SLF on in the market less than a year ago and instead of Guinness World Record for simultaneous player logins, the concept is a colony fleet that came from space died out but not before leaving a new society behind. Thousands of years later, the PCs are living their lives at roughly medieval tech levels. This piece is interest as it's a setup that allows for effortless inclusion of sci-fi elements. Rikuro seems to be getting convinced, since unlike Feria which is so bad they hitters find themselves desperately searching for redeeming features. This game is so beloved that his few haters are completely drowned out by tens of thousands of fans. Rikuro puts down his gamer fuel and decides to try the game out. We then learn a bit about the company that made the game called Utopia Entertainment Software. It was founded by the genius programmer Tsukuyo Tsukuri, who developed a fully immersive VR game system. It's a leader in the fields of software development, hardware, and internet service provision. Rikuro puts on his virtual reality headset and wonders how long it's been since he played something that wasn't trash. The game begins with character creation and Rikuro amazed by how many options there are for classes. He chooses a twin blade mercenary for its flexibility and then moves on to origin. He reads that wanderers build defense slowly but get bonuses to luck. Luck affects critical chance and item drop rate, so he decides to go with that. Things begin to get really exciting when he finds how many options there are to character customization, as it allows him to even change race and body type. He makes some really strange noises as he gets a bit too excited and he reminds himself to calm down. Rikuro realizes that he has been so poisoned by trash games that he is now getting blown away by silly small stuff. Seemingly forgetting about what he just said, Rikuro excitedly states that it's time to go hardcore on character design for the first time in forever. We then surprisingly see that his finished character design looks a bit strange, but it at least saves us the pain of having to look at his ugly face. He is not to be mistaken as a half-naked furry, since he actually has a very good reason for doing this. We learn that his playstyle consists of ignoring armor in favor of getting the best weapons possible. These weapons are costly, of course, but in SLF amazingly you're given the option to sell your starter equipment during character creation and you can make quite a profit. Rikuro thankfully he wanted to hide his face and the only option was the dumb looking bird mask. He had no choice as it would be pretty awkward for him to play half naked if everyone could see his face. Rikuro is the type of player who uses the same name in every game he plays, so he inputs the name Sunraku. He lays down on his bed and finally enters the game, he skips right past the prologue because who actually cares and arrives in the world of the god tier game to find one of his kind. It flies away and Sunraku immediately impressed, since moving around feels pretty much like real life. He tests everything by running and climbing through the area and points out how much better everything feels compared to the game with the disgustingly hideous girl in it. Sunraku marvels at how large the world is and pulls out a map, he wonders why he didn't start out in a tutorial town for beginners like most games, and doesn't realize that those who choose Wanderer as their origin start out at a random point in the beginner's area. He decides to head to the starting town but once again admires how good the controls feel. He checks his stats and acknowledges that his low defense is because of his half-nakedness but hopes that his high luck stat will make up for it. Just then he's surprised to be attacked so soon as he encounters a goblin, Sunraka refuses to be a half-naked coward and decides that it's time to see what the game's combat engine is made of. The brave little goblin initiates the fight but probably regrets all his life decisions as Sunraku uses a powerful attack to slice him in half. Sunraku impresses himself but acknowledges that that goblin was just a scrub enemy in the intro. It does level him up though and he sees that this axe can be dual wielded. Something moves and some bushes nearby and Sunraka thinks about how there's a lot to learn in the game like monster weaknesses patterns and item drops. He states that whether it's a trash game or god tier game everyone gets to feeling he's getting now. The elation of diving head first into a new world, it's something that can't be found in real life. His enemy finally emerges from the bushes and just barely misses his attack on Sunraku. The attack was extremely powerful and he acknowledges that it would have put him down if it hit him. The terrifying bunny goes in for another attack but this time her crew blocks it and he counters while landing a critical hit. Bugs Bunny with rabies is far too determined though and continues attacking. Sun Raku is disappointed with what this game has to offer and we see that he has pierced the bunny. He explains that the bunny just kept going for his neck, so it was far too easy to figure out how to counter it. He is glad to see that he has leveled up even more but disappointed to not see the rabbit sword as loot. Just then his stat screen reveals that he has met a certain condition and learned the skill flash counter. Apparently he can unlock skills by taking certain actions, so Sunraka takes a moment to appreciate how well designed the game is. He realizes that since the player's own skill supplements their dodges and parries, he can fight pretty well against even higher level enemies. 
This makes him want to try a bunch of different fighting styles. His appreciation doesn't stop there though, as Sunrocka realizes that he has been playing this entire time without encountering a single bug, we then watch all the previous bugs he had to deal with such as the hitbox bug, the clipping bug and the infamous invisibility bug. He expresses excitement as he wasn't sure if he could enjoy a bug-free game after all this time but it's sure now that he can really have a good time with it. Sunrocka heads out in search of another rabies bunny but suffer a moment to completely destroy an ogre. He levels up again and decides that he should probably allocate his stat points. He wishes that the Vorpal Bunny would spawn more often but realizes that it must be a rare enemy. He still managed to kill 50 of them and get his sweet looking dual swords. He also learns some new skills but states that only one of them is worth using. Sun Raku decides to move forward though since he's not going to gain any more levels with the scrub tier monsters around there. He has strayed too far away from the starter town but sees that he's close to another town aptly named Second Ill. He makes his way there but sees there a snake with ponytails is blocking a bridge. Sun Raku relieved to finally have a real challenge and prepares to fight to Stylish Serpent. Don't let the poor hair design fool you, this piece is actually very powerful as it is the area boss that is meant to be fought by a party. Sun Raku takes a moment to think about all the attacks a snake usually has in games. He states that with an avatar that actually moves the way he wanted to, he doesn't need defenses to beat the boss and he charges forward. He demands that the game give him something exciting and we see that Sun Raku is enjoying himself quite a bit. The story continues at the exit of a nearby town several people look at something in amazement. Their jaws drop and we see that it's someone wearing gigantic armor. This is the starting town first here, the townspeople see that this person has high level equipment and a crest from an achievement focused clan. The clueless bunch wonder what someone like that is doing there and we can tell by the voice that it's a girl. She checks all the names of the people in front of her and reminds herself that Sun Raku gives all his characters the same name. He's in there though which is strange since all starting players come to first Tia. Back in real life, we see that Sun Raku's stalker knows no bounds as it was her looking for him in the game. Back with her pigeon-faced hero, he begins his attack on the snake with her soul mesmerizing, it's as if it was stolen from an angel. Sun Raku decides to watch its patterns and dodges a few of its attacks. The genius gamer determines that it's still a boss for beginners. Its movements are easy to read and it won't have any instant kill moves. The glass cannon realizes that he can beat this thing without taking a hit, since even one hit would kill him anyway. Sun Raku masterfully dodges another attack but his weapon shatters. He knew its their ability was getting low but can't believe it just broke on the first hit. He sees that Princess Ponytails has tough scales and decides that it's time to try out his sweet blood blades. Sun Raku goes in for an attack while quipping that he's going to make snake fillets but is surprised by some purple stuff spewed out by the Ponytail Python. His first thought is that it might be poop but a display reveals that it's poison and he will take damage every 10 seconds. Featherface realizes that he might have underestimated the snake and its beautiful flowing head of hair. Our god of trash games tells us snake that he has beaten trash cans with mechanics way cheaper than this and a little poop flinging won't be enough to get him down. Sun Raku thinks about how the poison deals some, 1 damage every 10 seconds which means he has about 4 minutes left so he will need a reliable way to land critical if he wants to beat it. Our birdman uses his bird brain to determine that criticals in this game don't trigger at random. They seem to trigger when an attack is landed in an ideal way or when an enemy is hit in the weak point. The snake isn't just fashionable its body is covered in super tough scales, so he concludes that its weak point has to be its head. The snake super protective of its stylish hair, blocks his attack making Sun Rocker realize that landing an attack on its head won't be easy. Instead he decides to make his own weak point and uses the move screw pierce to pierce its body. He continues to attack the hole he made and this absolute god gamer states that the defensive properties of a wounded section change allowing criticals to trigger there. The snake dramatically screams in pain with this beautiful head of hair flowing through the wind like it's in a shampoo commercial. Sun Raka hacks away as his time is running out but he has no clue how much HP the snake has and isn't sure if he will make it. He is pushed back and Sun Raku now realizes that beating trash games online made him pretty cocky. When he initially entered this mass appeal game for casuals, this cocky peacock thought that he would be able to know his things easily and wouldn't have to use recovery items. He was just being arrogant though and the state consumes him, Sun Raku isn't done yet and uses his flash counter move. Sun Raku takes the upper hand by grabbing onto a lock of its hair that is so beautiful it rivals that of a unicorn's tail. One last piercing screw to its face causes its head to explode and we say goodbye to the hair salon loving serpent. Sun Raku couldn't be happier as he levels up after defeating the old poop snake, his look is good enough to fetch a good price but he notices that his health is still dropping. He has no time to distribute his attribution points and just dumps it all into stamina and agility. 
The bird starts to fly back to town to buy an antidote but realizes he doesn't know where the shops are and is certain he won't make it in time. He can't even register his respawn points since he doesn't know where the ends are yet but he has no choice but to run as fast as he can like he's on a wild goose chase. At the time, we see that a guy named Reiji is ecstatic that after three months of trying, he finally got the girl he's crushing on to start playing as a left with him. Her name is Mia. This Romeo has maneuvered himself into the role of the advice-giving veteran and won't let this chance pass him by. Unfortunately his intimate encounter is interrupted by a raging lunatic and Mia thinks that it's a monster. Reiji points out that it has a name so it must be a player. This crazy girl thinks she should kill it anyway but Reiji points out that killing other players puts the skull in front of your name. The murderous psychopath considers it but decides against it and they wonder if the bird got hit with a poison poop. Reiji tells him where the inn is but explains that the respawn point will only register once he gets in bed. At the inn the receptionist is talking way too calmly as she points out all the amenities they have to offer. So our frantic hero rushes her. Sun Raku finally makes it to his bed to register his respawn point but the poison hasn't been cured and he dies. Sun Raku returns to reality where he is disappointed to have died but glad he didn't lose any items, he decides that he will have to thank the guy that helped him but for now just appreciates how awesome the game SLF is. Our god of trash games eventually arrives in secondal in search of necessities like a map and recovery items. The bird thinks he should buy a powerful main weapon to help him reach his goal of hitting the top player ranks, but soon realizes that perverts are staring at him for being half naked and he makes the right decision by going to get clothes first. He just gets the cheapest clothes he come by since it's only to keep people from looking at him weird, but then strangely decides that his bird head is less weird looking than a mask. At a weapon shop Sunraka doesn't like what it has to offer and the weapons or guy points out the Sunraka's bunny daggers are actually very rare. Sun Raku becomes excited however when the man explains that he can make him weapons but he would have to get the materials. Our little pigeon wastes no time and Inslee has swan area with plenty of ore. However he gets his feathers all flustered as he just ends up mining stone after stone. He is frustrated since he has been swinging his pickaxe for at least 30 minutes but only has two of the six pieces of ore he needs. As if he didn't have enough to worry about with all the mud and heavy pickaxe an annoying frog appears to do what frogs do, this poor frog messed with the wrong bird. This little frog swims in the mud like it thinks it's swimming in the Olympics and it has its innocent little heart set on first place. Sun Raka thought they could coexist since it wasn't that dangerous, but determined that the frog clearly wants to be turned into materials, his attack knocks the innocent little frog back so he goes in to finish it off. He knows that the frog has slash resistance since his suit is made from its skin and decides that he can only use bludgeoning piercing attacks. His ex is perfect for this but his father's got all ruffled again when he realizes that the marsh's mud slows down a player's movement significantly. The poor little frog meets its demise at the hands of her beak-faced hero but it was so easy for him that it didn't even cheer him up. Sun Raka notices that more new players have been showing up lately because of summer break and determines that he must beat everyone to the race for materials. Afterwards Sun Raku amazed is the shop owner with all his ore. He's told that one of the pieces is really special and has two blades made from it. After some time they are ready and he finds out that they are god-tier weapons. This very helpful blacksmith states that doing something called raising a weapon is very important. Raising turns out to just mean upgrading but it's a term used by blacksmiths that take their job way too seriously and think of the weapons they make as their children. Sun Raku can think about is how the blacksmith is an NPC but its speech and mannerisms are amazing. The NPC tells them not to leave town in armor like he has while it's dark, since nocturnal animals are dangerous. Little does he know our crazy bird friend is up to the challenge and plans to use those dangerous nocturnal animals to break in his new weapons and pal up some more levels. Back at the bridge we see that the snake has risen from the ashes like a phoenix with its hair more dazzling than 1000 suns. Unfortunately it is meant by a powerful attack from Rei who continues her search for Sun Raku. This stalker detective searched the entire beginner's area for him but determined that he must have defeated the snake without stopping by town and is now in Secondia. She wonders if a new player could really accomplish such a thing but is confident that if anyone could it would be Sun Raku. Elsewhere, our better loving birdie fights Gollum from the Lord of the Rings and he goes over everything he has learned. First, monster spawns change based on if it's day or night. Most nocturnal monsters are aggressive and dangerous as a weapon seller said that has helped him to make progress leveling up and to learn some new skills. However, this particular little beast seems a little too powerful. This one's movement and attacks are on a whole other level from the forest goblins. It's got lots of HP and incorporates feints into his fighting style like it's been doing it all its life, like it's fighting for freedom ring. Just then the little goblin that's not a crazy sounding battle cry and calls all its little goblin buddies. 
As if fighting one wasn't bad enough now he has to face several and he determined that he would have to run at full speed just to have a chance of getting away. However, just then Sun Raku snaps himself out of that mentality and reminds himself that he's enjoying himself far too much to just run away. Sun Raku may be a bird but he is no chicken and takes on the challenge as he defeats the annoying little goblins. Sun Raku thinks about how he has just been having a lot of fun this entire time and telling himself that god tier games are pretty neat. However, this game has much more to offer. It is in this very moment as a gigantic ferocious monster appears. The Sun Raku encountered the true Shangri-La frontier. Sun Raku can't believe his eyes as he learns that it's a unique monster and he braces himself for the fight of his life. The story continues the time is currently early in the morning in the real world and we get to see Rei's room where she is secretly in love with her Rakuro aka Sun Raku. As we pass by the teddy bear in her room we see that she is still playing Shangri-La Frontier, probably still looking to find Sun Raku in the endgame world. That actually seems to be the case as the scene shifts to show the Shangri-La Frontier word, where Rei is investigating two players about some Sun Raku's whereabouts. These two players Reiji and Mia are the ones who actually briefly saw Sun Raku when he was trying to find a respawn point a few days ago. Reiji tells Rei that they have indeed seen him but unfortunately aren't in any contact with him. Mia gets hostile after seeing Rei's gigantic figure and takes out her bow and arrow assuming she is a monster but Reiji stops her just in time and explains to her that Rei is a player and not a monster. But Mia doesn't believe him as she doesn't think such a scary looking creature can be an actual player. So Reiji takes his time to explain to her that once the players get more experienced and veteran like they end up looking bulky and strong like Rei. Speaking of Rei, she doesn't seem to care whether other players think she is scarier or not and she asks Reiji if he knows where Sun Raku is gone, although Reiji isn't sure since he is very intimidated by Rei. He elaborates on the time when he saw Sun Raku running inside the town when he was poisoned by the python boss learning that Sun Raku is in the second town. It's as if Rei almost doesn't believe it as she cannot imagine her being so close to her crush. She also can't crash as to how Sun Raku was able to beat the ravenous python boss without even visiting starter town and using the starter gear regardless. She thanks both Reiji and Mia for giving her this critical information and gives them an item named Teleport Coordinator as a gift in exchange. Now that the formalities are done Rei takes her leave in a hurry and leaps away from there literally at the speed of light. After she goes out of sight Mia asks Reiji if he has any clue who she is. According to what Reiji knows, he recognized the emblem on Rei's cape and that emblem belongs to a clan or a guild that focuses on fighting a unique monster like kicking the Night Slayer. Apparently unique monsters are a special class of monsters with both a name and a title. Most monsters, when beaten or captured respond after a certain time passes but in the case of unique monsters, there is only one of each in the whole Shangri-La Frontier world. According to some speculations, there are seven unique monsters and Shangri-La Frontier and much information is not known about them. For each of these unique monsters who are also known as Colossi because of their colossal shape and size, the top players have formed clans focused on taking them out and Rei, a member of one of these seven clans, is the one who focuses on the Colossi Lycagon. Speaking of Lycagon, our main character has conveniently run into that same Colossi and is probably about to die his worst death in a game while he is getting his butt kicked. Reiji elaborates more about the unique monsters to Mia, telling her that even though the game has over 30 million players, not a single person has been able to defeat one single Colossi and that record isn't going to happen just because this newbie is the main character. As the clouds clear up from the skies, the moon gives better lighting and reveals what this unique monster looks like. Sun Raka beds his balls that if he takes one hit from this Colossi is good as death but still he doesn't back off from the fight. As he wishes to see what this game is actually about and as the Colossi comes charging right at him with a paw attack, Sun Raka blocks it with his dagger and takes the fight head on. He makes it clear that he isn't backing down and that gets Colossi more interested in killing him. As it prepares for another charge Sun Raku makes a bluff, saying that it won't even take a breather for him to kill this beast. Even though his facial expressions and oversleeping say otherwise as his heart begins to pump heavily. He reveals that he only managed to block Colossi's attack because of his skill called Perfect Parry, which lets him parry an enemy's physical attack if he executes it at the correct time. Realizing that his main dagger won't last much longer if he keeps parrying with it, Sun Raku eclipses previous red dagger and jumps straight at the Colossi dealing a critical hit, he keeps dodging around and lands another critical hit, which only infuriates the Colossi even more. 
so it hides itself in the depths of the shadows and attacks Sunraku when he is not looking, but Sunraku still senses the attack coming from behind and dodges it without even taking a scratch, making the Colossi so enraged that it disappears in the shadows once again, as it attacks Sunraku with an even stronger attack, he also increases his own speed and keeps landing critical hits on this game-breaking monster. The Colossi keeps on playing with Sunraku and activates its hidden teleportation skill to have even better speed. Although Sanraku gets nervous this time around, he doesn't let that feeling get on top of his pure excitement and keeps pairing with the Colossi for quite a while. Although the system has shown hundreds of times now that Sanraku has dealt tons of critical hits, he still doesn't see what damage he has caused to this Colossi being. Moreover, because of all these attacks Sanraku's second weapon has become totally chipped and has begun to fall apart, so he looks for a weak spot in the Colossi before his weapons eventually run out, but even he knows that wouldn't be possible as he is way too out of the Colossi right now, but that's what makes loner boys like him and me stand out, forcing ourselves on someone who is clearly way out of our league. Anyway Sunraku who actually likes being out of someone's league and loving the challenge he gives another shout out to this god tier game, Shangri-La Frontier. The adrenaline rushes in him and he keeps on landing critical hits on the Colossi, landing a straight hit into its eyes, but instead of the eyes being a weak spot, it seems to be made of unbreakable metal as Sunraku doesn't even manage to make a scratch on it. This time the Colossi gets too enraged and roars like a wolf, as if it is trying to call its pack mates here. The Colossi roar's force is so strong that it even freezes Sunraku who is midair. The clouds cover up the moon again and it causes the Colossi to fade away in the shadows, but it doesn't disappear and it attacks Sunraku again even more fiercely and cuts off both of his legs, stopping him from moving like a monkey. While Sunraku is still in disbelief as to how he got cut, Colossi waits for his death and as Sunraku's health points lower to only one. He admits that the Colossi is absurdly strong and also admits his own defeat but Sunraku isn't the guy who is going to give up and tells Colossi that they will be meeting again soon and at that time he will be the one who comes out as the winner. As he dies from the bite of like again, he gets a curse applied to him called like Higgins mark and responds inside his inn. As he gets up, he finds many of Lycagon's marks on his body and although it looks cool, since it's a curse no equipment can be equipped for the body where Lycagon has made a mark, meaning no more armor from Mr. Half-Naked Sunraku. He realizes that he is completely screwed because of a curse and that his equipment has also been destroyed because he was wearing it while getting marked by Lycagon, realizing that the only way to get rid of the curse is to defeat Lycagon. Sunraku curses the game itself for a while but as he begins to look like a weird creep again, he stops overreacting and reduces skill point division so that he no longer remains a weakling. But no matter how he rotates his points, he still remains as fragile as a glass making him realize that because of this curse, he has become so fragile that he will die if he is hit by any monster including slime. So he instead puts all of his experience points into his luck, hoping destiny is the only thing that will save him from this hellhole and as he does so, a rabbit appears right in front of him, guiding him to the dead end. The rabbit then shows him a hidden door and reveals that it was actually an invitation from Rabbituza. Seeing this unique scenario Sunraku remembers that he read that this game actually has a huge number of side quests involving NPCs and this must be one of those unique side quests. So Sunraku hopes for the best and opens the door that leads him to a weird room. He realizes that he must have unlocked this unique scenario thanks to his sudden increase in luck, but what he doesn't notice is that the minimum requirement to accept this quest is level 80. Since he is only at level 28 this only means that his luck is about to go down into the ground. Anyway, being unaware of that Sunraku who heads to the rabbit town called Rabbituza, where every single creature is a rabbit, the rabbit that gave him an invitation welcomes him to Rabbituza and tells him that everyone in Rabbituza has become a huge fan of him overnight. Apparently his being super weak but still having the courage to fight the Colossi has caused the rabid people of Rabbituza to become fond of him. This white rabbit claims that because of his courageous nature, Sunraku is considered to be the embodiment of a Vorpal rabbit soul and she too hopes that one day she can be someone so daring like him. Sunraku doesn't think that he should get this much respect, as he didn't even manage to make a scratch on the Colossi. But the white rabbit Emol tells him that it doesn't matter how weak he is, what matters is how endearing he has shown himself to be. According to Emol, because of his courageous nature, even the Colossi no longer treats him as a mere pre but as a fellow being. So in light of Sunraku's great deeds the big boss of Rabbituza has insisted on speaking with him and has requested an audience with him now that the explanation part is done Emol tells Sunraku to follow her and leads him to the place where her boss is. As they enter the palace of Rabbituza Emol tells Sunraku that he is the first one who has gotten the chance to come here, meaning that this is indeed quite a unique scenario. 
What's more, Emol's boss doesn't look like a cute bunny and actually has the body of a bear more or less. This leaves Sunraku completely shocked and makes him wonder why he is even here. Story continue, back at the game shop Mana catches Ray the stalker extraordinaire on the prowl for her not-so-secret crush Rakuro aka Sunraku. Ray tries to deny it but the game shop owner isn't stupid and explains that it's summer vacation, so he's probably in Shangri-La Frontier. Ray admits that she hasn't been able to find her prey in game because he skipped the first tutorial city entirely. Mana laughs as charting his own course is classic Rakuro and a typical trash game fanatic move. She explains that Rakuro will do things normal players won't do and run into all kinds of outrageous unique scenarios. Mana encourages the little stalker to step up her stalking game but surprises her when she tells Ray to admit her feelings to him. In the next scene we meet Rumi Hisatomi, she's about to begin her storyline but she leaves and we don't see her again. Meanwhile, Rakuro is reading about the trigger conditions for the tour of Rabatuza unique scenario. He learns that if you defeat a monster of a higher level than you with Vorpal weapons equipped, a special Vorpal bunny will appear in any town and invite you to Rabatuza once you arrive if you defeat the Laconian Python. A monster terrorizing their city you'll learn the enchant Vorpal spell. The beginning part was right but Rakuro explains that the rest of his unique scenario that happened the day before was nothing like that. He definitely didn't end up wrestling any pythons instead it was the intimidating Yakuza boss looking bunny, the sort of cuddly terror you would expect if the mob started to recruiting and petting zoos. A look back shows that Vice Ash complimented Sunraku on his fight against the puppy, he admires Sunraku's Vorpal soul but Sunraku can't help but be intimidated and wonders what in the world is a Vorpal soul. That Yakuza bunny then makes him an offer he can't refuse, the offer to get him up to snuff. Sunraku pretty confused at first but then realizes that this must be a training quest and unique scenario training could yield the amazing buffs. He quickly accepts the offer but almost gets himself whacked when he calls Vice Ash Anaki as it made him very angry. Sunraku explains that it was just a little joke but the giant bugs bunny on steroids doesn't say a word. Luckily for Sunraku Vice Ash has a sense of humor as he doesn't call a hit on him and lets out a big laugh instead. He acknowledges Sunraku as his underling and asks him to call him Vash. This is a privilege only given to those with potential and Sunraku accepts as he thinks about how he is glad that they see Yakuza Bunny didn't have him swimming with the fishes. Vash tells them more than excited Emol that he will leave her curl in his hands, which of course the weird little bunny loves and he promised to work super hard. Emol excited to take Sanraku on a tour of the palace but Sanraku explains that he needs a break after a long playing session, but instead he thinks about how he also wants to look up more about unique scenarios and unique monsters, Sanraku glad to hear that he can register his respawn point there and Emol offers to take care of it. Vash remembers that he forgot one thing and puts a Vorpal Soul Collar on Sanraku. Sunraku is shocked to find that the collar gains two and one half times the stat points when leveling up, but will only receive half the experience. He instantly tries to take it off, but Vash explains that it's no use. He won't allow Sunraku to take it off since extraordinary hardship is necessary for the weak to grow strong. He then reminds Sunraku to never forget the Vorpal Soul. The goofy little bunny tells him that it looks great on him but Sunraku just can't believe that he has been saddled with another restriction. Back to the present, Rakuro acknowledged that even if it does have his experience getting two and one half times the staff points is a pretty big upside, it might even be a broken cheat code. No one on the forum seems to know about Vice Ash or Emol let alone the Vorpal Soul Caller. No one's even found a unique scenario where you entered the palace of Robotuza. He gets super hyped as he realizes how amazing it is to have found a unique scenario only he knows about. Unfortunately, he has an appointment with someone named Katso and loads up a game he hasn't logged into in forever. It's called Berserk Online Passion, or as some people calls it Borp. It's a fighting game he once got deeply into and naturally this means that it's a trash game. Its player base has waiting to less than 100 signings per day, leading many to wonder why the server is still running. This means that most of those who remain playing the game know each other they're all of single kind trash game enthusiasts. Sunraku meets with Katsu and asks for the rules of the fight. The fight begins though as Katsu does his best impression of Luffy without a straw hat and reminds Sunraku that anything goes. Katsu shows him his new move he worked out while Sunraku was focused on Foley Online that he calls NSFW Tentacle Attack. Sunraku surprises see that Tattoo developed a new glitch and wonders how a madman like him got to be a pro gamer. 
Katso is shocked since he is using a delay but Sunraku is still somehow managing to block his attack. Katsu calls Sunraku the real madman for having such fast reaction speed and Sunraku points out that his quick draw fist is the ultimate fighting style. He explains that as long as he has 12 frames, he can even counter boss insta-killer attacks and scathe. The two continue their fight that looks like something right out of One Piece and people around begin to take notice. Though Borp is considered a trash game, their fight perfectly demonstrates the reason for Borp's niche appeal and that is that any bug goes. Their Gatling gun punching continues and Sun Raku celebrates when he breaks off one of Katso's fists. Unfortunately, this ends up being bad for him as that fist ends up ending the fight. Sun Raku can't believe that the after-image fist textures were part of the hitbox and he has announced the loser. Still Sun Raku thinks Katsu, as he has only been fighting NPCs recently and needed a good PvP, Katsu hoped that Sun Raku was telling a bad joke when he learned that he was playing SLF, but Sun Raku takes no shame in admitting that he is actually really into it. His little friend still doesn't understand so Sun Raku explains SLF has crazy strong monsters called the Seven Colossi. They are so rare that the entire player base has only managed to get the names of four of them. No one has ever beaten a single one of them since the game started. Sun Raku reveals that he found one of these beasts and it wasted him, with that Katso was convinced and he decides that he might to give SLF a try. Hearing Sun Raku talk about it has piqued his interest and he admits that none of his IRL friends played Borp anyway. That isn't all as a certain person also plays SLF and Katsu sent this person a message to tell them that Sun Raku was playing it too. Sun Raku has no clue who this person is but we see that it's some purple haired girl. This chick is fighting a bunch of guys when she received the message and she said she always thought Sun Raku had some kind of condition where he would die if he ever stopped playing trash games. She finishes up all her opponents and we see that she has the player kill badge for ending all those real players. She seems glad there's Sun Raku playing SLF and decides that she will have to also gently guide him through it. Sun Raku returns to second ale and thinks about how handy a mole is for being able to use a teleport gate. He feels pretty good and wonders if coming from playing Borp is the reason that his SLF avatar is so easy to move in. Emol wonders where Sun Raku wanted to leave so soon since there is so much to do in Rabatuza. Sun Raku explains that while he really wants to explore Rabatuza, getting to third Rima before the crowds are pouring in is more important. There has been a huge uptick in players since summer break started. The forms report that the Star Town first Tia is packed to the gills with new players. Second Ale won't be far behind which means there are going to be log jams at facilities and fights over monsters and mining spots. Also, Third Rima is a pretty big city so if he's going to go all out and the rabbit is a unique scenario, then he would like to do it from a big city with plenty of breathing room. Emol completely agrees, but Sun Raku to hear that Emol hilariously didn't understand a single thing. Emol is still more than glad to help and Sun Raku is shocked to find that he can add NPCs in his party, and Mol explains that Sun Raku can't retry Rabatuza or the palace without him, but Sun Raku thought that the little free NPC would just be tagging along. Sun Raku accepts a mole party request and finds that the little bunny has higher stats than he does. He's in too concerned about it though since he is confident that he will pass a mole no time. Sun Raku pretty sure that the Lycagon's mark is the trigger for that unique scenario, and wonders if Emol is the game's way of making up for it. The two prepare to head out but are stopped by two girls who think that the talking little bunny is adorable. They want to know if they can get it as a pet too per shot to realize that Recur was one half naked bird pervert. Sun Raku realizes that he was so distracted that he didn't stop to think about how Emol's NPC attached to a never before seen unique scenario. Since he has it all to himself for now, he would like to keep it a secret at least until he can clear it. The dumb little bunny introduces himself and tries to chat it up with the ladies. However, Sun Raku stops him and yells out that it was just his ventriloquism act as he runs away. Unfortunately for him, one of the nosy girls takes a picture of them and decides that they will have to ask the forums where to get one of the talking bunnies. The two get away from all the crowds and Emol admits to not being the high-level athlete looks like, as he is not so well suited for all the running around. Emol eagerly awaits her next task and Sun Raku explains that he wants to confirm something. He wants to test the part of his curse that says that monsters over lower level than the afflicted character will flee. Luckily for them, a lower leveled monster appears to attack them and it runs away as soon as it sees the curse. This is perfect, as Sun Raku chases after it like some kind of bird cheetah hybrid. A brilliant gamer doesn't just pursue it mindlessly though, as he has a plan to chase it into an obstacle, with perfect timing Sun Raku throws his weapon as soon as it changes direction. 
With it stopped Sunraku attacks it with the fastest speed he can muster. Sunraku points out that he received an attack bonus from inertia, and law of physics taken for granted in the real world and very few games actually try to replicate it. He admires how this game models reality as close as it can and Amol arrives to celebrate with intense energy as always, he admires Sunraku's fighting skills as he could hardly tell which one was the monster. With Sunraku test complete he has decided what needs to be done now. The plan is to ignore all the scrubs and head straight to the area boss. Emol marvels at the plant's simplicity and the two take off excited to take on whatever the future holds. Unfortunately, just seconds later we see that Sunraku is extremely frustrated. They have arrived at the area where the boss should be but there's only swamp as far as the eye can see. The little rabbit is just worried about his sweet looking clothes and Sunraku thinks about what Emol told him on the way there. Emol explained that the area boss is a monster named Mud Digger. Sunraku try out of the ground to attack so it's crucial to find a way to hold it in place. Sunraku realizes that he has to fight this mud digger in a swamp that means he might be in big trouble. Just then, Emol senses the beast and Sunraku has Emol get on his shoulder. It's incredibly difficult to move in the swamp, so they just barely manage to move out of the way as a giant monster emerges. We learn that a characteristic of Shangri-La Frontiers is that its swamp terrain forces a walking state. This means that one leg always remains trapped in the muds until the other foot reaches the bottom. This ferocious beast is clearly very powerful as a recommended party size for fighting it is for. Sun Rocker realizes that he might have made a huge mistake, as this is the worst matchup possible. That brings the episode to an end. Story continues, the ferocious beast is strangely able to dive into the shallow swamp, which is only possible because of game logic and Emol freaks out fearing that they will be skinned alive. However, Sunraku smoothly uses his slide move to narrowly avoid death. He acknowledges that figuring out how to use the skills that evolved after fighting the Leica gun is the key to this battle. His evolution of the move Perfect Parry is the Rebel Counter, which allows him to instantly counter attack after timing his parry perfectly. Emol is pressed but Sunraku isn't satisfied since he is pretty much just evading damage, both skills he just used have 10 second recast times and he has no other way to avoid damage in the meantime. The beast gives him no breaks but luckily his little bunny friend comes in clutch with an impressive attack. Emol explains that it was just a bit of magic and Sunraku realizes that he has been so focused on soloing this game that he completely forgot he had a partner this time. Sunraku knows he can't waste this opportunity, so he uses an ability that grants a temporary bonus to attack power and agility. Unfortunately, trying to move quickly in the swamp sucks big time. The beast recovers but this caused Sunraku the opportunity to use the evolution of his screw pierce attack called Spiral Edge. Another ability gets them in a more advantageous position and Sunraku does a balancing act, only possible because of his experience in trash games that have terrible platforming. He has his little bunny friend prepare an attack and there's the ferocious beast to eat him. It tries to but 10 seconds have passed already and he uses repel counter to avoid it. Emol follows that up with a powerful attack and we see just how much of a glass cannon Sunraku is, as a tiny bit of fall damage takes a large portion of his health. Sunraku praises his free teammate but she is just concerned about her sweet threads, Sunraku is confident that the beast must be pretty hurt but he was shocked when it's nowhere to be found. Meanwhile, the ground begins to shake and Sunraku feels like his feet are being sucked down. They realize that the shark whale thing is preparing to rocket out of the ground for an attack and Sunraku doesn't even hesitate to save his little friend. Sunraku is surprised to have been thrown into the air since it wasn't an insta-kill attack and in fact barely did any damage. We learn that the mud digger is most noteworthy for its special move set that activates after its HP reaches a certain threshold. After holding a player in place with the vibrating swamp, it randomly runs one of them in the air with its nose. If a player challenges it alone, not only will it hit them with this attack every single time as long as they remain in the swamp, but it will shave down all their HP through fall damage. Hence its nickname, the Solo Killer, Sunrocker realizes this and hits the person who came up with it, since player skills are not even a factor, he considers having Emol hit him from the side but knows that will just blow him up. Sunraku prepares for his inevitable death and explains that he has never been able to get used to falling deaths in VR games. Luckily for him our little bunny hero is no quitter and she has an unrivaled Vorpal spirit. She uses a magic scroll to teleport Sunraku but instead of getting to safety, she accidentally puts him back in the air. We learn that there is an attack skill called Meteor Fall that utilizes downward energy. Sunraku had picked up a ton of downward momentum from his initial freefall and built up a lot of energy. 
and Maul's accidental teleportation actually put them just above the beast and allowed Sun Raku to gain even more energy, so a fall that would have resulted in player death. Instead is now a risky attack, this is not an actual meteor fall but a mistake meteor fall. The creature instantly blows up into smithereens and Sun Raku in complete disbelief to see that he actually survived. He can't even digest all the things that just happened, so he just compliments Emol for her clutchness. Sun Raku acknowledges how tough the fight was, comparing it to when he fought the like again but this time they were the survivors. Afterward, Emol shocked to see Birdhead shove a bunch of healing herbs down his throat and Sun Raku points out that it's the only way anything can reach his mouth because of his giant beak, Sun Raku can only think about how Emol was way stronger than he expected. She ended up carrying him so he feels pretty bad for being so cocky before, and Mulk can only think about how Sun Raku will be staying in Rabatuza full time once they reach the big city. The only problem is that Emol is seen, will draw a lot of attention like last time and they might even get jumped. They need to think of a way to hide her, so our little bunny determines that she must use something she hasn't in a long time. She reveals her mysterious Vorpal bracelet, the secret treasure of the verbal bunnies. The secret of Little Bunny asks her human counterpart to keep it a secret and shockingly transforms into a human. Sun Rock is speechless and is upset as he begins to realize that Japan's so-called flagship god tier game is starting to look like some kind of harem game with a bunny girl. The transformation is pretty exhausting for the little rabbit though, so she can only hold it for 4 or 5 minutes at a time in her current state. Her transformation will work just fine to hide her but it could bring different attention when people see a poor girl dragging around half-naked birdman. They finally arrive at Thirdrama where Emol points out how unimpressed Sun Raku seems. Birdface proudly points out that he has seen quite a few places in his time and she is amazed by how well-traveled he is. Emol transforms but Sun Raku's proven right about him being the attention getter when some guards stop them to ask why he is half-naked. They are also pretty curious about his body being covered in scars but Emol comes to Sun Raku defense. She states that Sun Raku has a past that will bring immense sorrow to all those who hear it. Emol tells the story of his dangerous journey in the most dramatic way possible, a story highlighting the curse Sun Raku has on his body and his journey to remove it. Emol gets even more intense as she explains that this is only the first chapter in this story, the second chapter will have him transform into a super warrior, this chick is way too intense for the guards and they just allow them in. Out of the entire crowd that has gathered to watch Emol's theatrics, Sun Raku notices someone giving him a look and it's far different than the normal judgmental look he usually gets for being a half-naked bird face. Before they can enter the city a girl urgently stops Sun Raku as she recognizes him. Sun Raku has no clue who this frantic girl is but we see what happened after those girls in second ale took their picture. The girls posted the picture on a forum and asked if anyone knew how to befriend the adorable bunny. The post spread rapidly as people were shocked to hear that a monster could talk and almost equally as shocked to see a half-naked birdman. The silvered-haired girl was more shocked than anyone, she was certain that the game only allowed players to tame dogs and cats, and determined that the bird must be cheating. As people questioned the ethics behind posting a picture of someone without their consent, the silvered-haired girl begins her mission to find the pigeon man. Other people were paying more attention to recur on the picture. Many have not seen scars like his, especially since nothing like them exists and the character maker. Someone on the forums remember is that it's a curse that also serves as proof that the player has been acknowledged by the Night Emperor. This is only known though because some NPC mentioned it. Players are stunned to realize that this means Sun Raku has encountered the Lycagon, some players know that the Lycagon is a random encounter, so it is possible for a beginner to run into it not no one can figure out how this Sun Raku guy managed to get acknowledged by it. A player named Orcelot responds on the forums, saying that he could spawn kill Sun Raku until he tells him how to do it. Other players think about how dangerous this Orcelot guy is, as he is the esteemed leader of Ashurakai, a clan infamous for being filled with player killers. Orcelot has eyes set on Sun Raku, so other players wonder if the Birdman will be okay. People discuss on the forums how if you player kill too much and you get killed by a player or NPC, all your items are lost including stored ones. On top of that, the bounty gets paid from the player killer's own cash, so it's a pretty brutal system. One red-headed lady is particularly intrigued by Sun Raku and leaves a message on the forums with the hopes of him reading it. She tells him to speak to any player wearing the emblem of a wolf and a sword, as she would love to meet and talk with him. She expresses sorrow for him having so much of his information leaked but explains that her Sijer clan can help protect him. Other players can see that several clans are showing interest in the now famous Sun Raku and point out how he is being treated like an event boss. The crazy silver-haired girl is the first to find him though and she just wants to know how to tame a Vorpal Bunny. 
While news of him has spread rapidly, this is Sun Rock of first time hearing about it, he realizes it must have been from Second Ale, but there's no way he's spilling the beans on the Vorpal Bunny unique scenario. Just then, their conversation is interrupted by a surprise attack, the attacker says that it's not nice to keep things to himself and everyone should share in the fun. This girl shocks for Sun Raku when she calls him Revolutionary Knight Sun Raku. Sun Raku seems to know her as he states that the Great Pencil Knight has finally shown her face. This girl doesn't like how he is talking to a self-proclaimed beauty like herself and explains to him that in this game she is not Pencil Knight. She shockingly removes her mask and tells him to refer to her as Arthur Pencilgan. Sun Raku is stunned to see that she is not only level 99 but she also has the skull badge for being a player killer. Story continues, Sun Raku refers to this person as his friend and trash gamer hood. A flashback shows some guys robbing a shop in a game called Unite Rounds. These fools thought they were scot-free but our boy Sun Raku found them and robbed the robbers. The players affectionately called this trash game a post-apocalyptic looting simulator. The game was originally meant to simulate a kingdom on the verge of collapse, with players assuming the role of knights who protected from attacking monsters a co-op MMOVR game. However, because of truly garbage game design that prioritized faithfulness to the concept the drop rates were unreasonably low. Only a few players would ever dare to play this game the right way, even the beginner's quest required 12 hours of coming through open fields to complete and the player's eyes, this only left them with one option steal what they need. Game rats weren't willing to spend hours picking through grass for low-level items when they could just raid an NPC store or steal them from a player who did, that eventually proved to be the winning move and unite rounds. In an environment where outrageous everywhere and every person you saw was an enemy, a lone figure arose filled by violence to take control of the kingdom and that person was the Great Pencil Knight. One day Sun Raku was looting corpses and cats who tried to point out that the game was supposed to be about defending the kingdom from monsters. However, Sun Raku explained that the game is now really about defeating the big bad Pencil Knight. Pencil Knight was nothing like the final boss built into the game story. She would intentionally abuse players who she didn't allow into her ranks and instigate her victims to prevent them from giving up on the game. At this time, the game of Unite Rounds was completely at the mercy of one player, the one known as the Dystopian Empress. Sun Raku cast on plan to assassinate her and she is shocked to see them and realize that a rebel army was used as a distraction. Our boys are pretty confident to have gotten this far and tell her that she should have said some more effective traps, the ones she said were so easy that they broke them on the first try. This is their first time meeting but the Empress is impressed and plans to remember their names. The Pencil Knight is pretty annoyed by Sun Raku's smirk and she wonders if they can really defeat her to become the Revolutionary Knight. Back to the present, Sun Raku thinks about how in Unite Rounds they fought each other to a draw with both of them dying in the end. However, in this game there's a huge level gap between them. Pencilgan instantly initiates the fight and tells Sun Raku that she took the penalty and came all the way from Fadisha to play or kill him, so he shouldn't be ashamed if he feels like crying because of how flattered he is. Pencilgan is not only a good trash talker, she's a dangerous fighter also, as Sun Raku must block daggers that he predicts are poisonous. She knows that Sun Raku just beat the mud digger and assumes that he's around level 30, so she compliments him on his impressive dodging skills. However, referral credits the gods are game for making all his moves come nice and smooth. The crazy silver-haired girl is shocked while watching the fight when she realizes that Pensilgan is second in command of that one-player killer clan Ashurakai, she is known as the giant killer. Pensilgan explains that she got the nickname from constantly focusing on ambushing higher-level players, unfortunately the devs need their ruthless strategy so it's been a lot harder for her recently. Sun Raku is quick to point out how she was the giant in the last game and the two have a good laugh about the irony. The lighthearted moment doesn't last long though, as Pensilgan continues attacking and calls our bird-headed hero a bird brain, and Mo realizes something while watching but doesn't say anything and just freaks out in the background. As Pensilgan continues her relentless attack, she reveals that she didn't just find him for personal reasons. The leader of her clan, Ashurakai has her to deliver a message, the leader wants Sun Raku to make the information of the unique scenario public, otherwise he will have a target on his back until he does, our boy does not like being threatened. He thinks this leader of her sounds like a dummy and Pensilgan actually agrees. Sun Raku does his best to fight back but he knows that there's far too much of a gap in their levels and equipment. However, he has realized something, Sun Raka points out that it seems like Pensilgan is trying pretty hard to keep him away from the gate. He is also certain that she timed that first attack of her is to prevent him from entering the city. 
He determines that it must be hard for a player killer to do their thing in a highly populated town and she reveals that she was certainly preferred to avoid it. None of the talking really matters to her though since she is certain that he won't be making it to the gate alive anyway, just then we see Emol freaking out about this whole time as her bunny tail reappears and she can't hold it in any longer. She will soon transform back to a Vorpal bunny but she has no way of telling Sun Raku without anyone finding out. The chaos is mounting as the crazy silver-haired girl decides to ask for Curl's companion but how to get the Vopal Bunny pet. She's surprised to see that Emol wearing bunny accessories but even more shocked when Emol transforms into the Vorpal Bunny she had been desperately searching for like a maniac, Sun Raku notices and points out how this is the worst possible moment for this to happen. Pinsilvian refuses to be ignored but is shocked and Sun Raku uses his repel counter move, he knocks her back with rage since he knows that she has been holding back and calls Emol to his side. Our boy catches his little bunny companion and Silver Hair wishes she could at least get a selfie with the little fur ball. Sun Raku explains that he will think about it if he survives his plan and makes a mad dash towards the gate. Pinsilgan is certain that Sun Raku has no chance in beating her in a foot race but it's shocked when Silver Hair stops her. Silver Hair explains that she couldn't care less about Bird Face but a Pinsilgan is going to put the sweet little bunny in danger, then she will slay Pinsilgan in a heartbeat. Sun Raku couldn't be happier as this is what he hoped would happen, he realized that the girl named Animalia was obsessed with his furry companion and he knew she would put herself in harm's way for her. He praises Emol for being a great mascot is not all he has to do is get into town, Emol will make him a teleport gate to Rabatuza and no one should be able to track him there. Sun Raku's plan runs into a huge problem though, as Pinsilden explains that she never said she came there alone. Sun Raku was met by a group of tough-looking players from Pinsilden's clan, they all hate the idea of having to pick a lower-level player but they must do it as if you're getting player killed themselves by Pinsilden if they don't. Pinsilden realizes that Animalia is the keeper of SF Zoo, a monster documenter clan with no interest in other players and she thanks Sun Raku for giving her this opportunity. Sun Raku isn't even listening though as he has his hands full trying to keep from being ended by the group. Animalia shows that she isn't just some crazy animal lover and Alicia is a powerful spell. Unfortunately, Pinsilgan consumes the attack and fires it right back at Animalia. The Pinsilgan is pretty impressed but all the status debuffs on Animalia has acquired and Animalia is shocked because Pinsilgan was able to reflect all the curses in her attack. Pinsilgan reveals the amazing item that allowed her to do this, the Karmic Straw Doll, Pinsilgan knows she would have been in big trouble without it and curses the thing. The item 1 crash sends all curses applied to the player back at their caster, so the cold-blooded pencil garnishes Animalia that she will stick around to watch her die of her own poison. Sun Raka doing his best to stay alive against opponents who outnumber him or a higher level than him and have far better equipment than him. He analyzes them to determine that his best target is the jerk who uses a slow-moving longsword since Sun Raka doesn't even need skills to dodge his attacks. The real problem is how he will do damage to the high-level players decked out in top-tier armor. Things are looking pretty bad but luckily someone has arrived to absolutely destroy one of the attackers with a single blow. Every one of the attackers is shocked as they realize that this was the unparalleled firepower of the famous attack master. Sun Raku has no clue who this person is but can't believe another person has arrived with such a dangerous sounding nickname. However, we know that this giant armor knight is actually Sun Raku's stalker Ray, and she's glad to have finally found the apple of her eye. A flashback shows how upset Ray was after not being able to find Sun Raku no matter how hard she looked and she thought about how Mana told her to confess her feelings to him. She thought about how Sun Raku always played games that were so unusual and difficult. They were always too hard for her to play so she could never find a game that she could play with him. However, that all changed with that SLF, Sun Raku is finally playing it so she refused to let her opportunity get away. When she returned to the game she found that a message was waiting for her, it was another member of her guild, Seijur that is also her sister. The message revealed Sun Raku location and asked for it to get into contact with him. This was Ray's first real chance to find him, so she wasted no time in rushing to him. The message also revealed that there were a number of clans already arranging to make contact with him and the dangers of Ashurakai was among them. Ray saw him deep in battle and realized that it was a great opportunity that she would never have again, if she could save him from the Pikers, she would have a natural end to talk to him. 
This drove her more than anything because she's crushing on him pretty hard and knew that this could someday lead to them talking in real life. That is when she made her explosive entrance and Pensilgan could instantly tell that things were getting intense, Pensilgan knew all along that the pikers from her clan would have a tough time against Sunraku. However, fighting him in SLF has made something even more clear to her, the skills he's built up playing terrible games in all genres are more valuable than unique items and high-level stats and that's a huge asset in Shangri-La Frontier. She has also heard that Katso is playing as SLF as well, so with Sun Raka some secret project of hers is looking more possible. Pensilgan is then shocked when she realizes that the person that has joined the fight is Sigur Zero somehow Sun Raka first lured in the zookeeper and now that attack master. Pensilgan is incredibly happy to have come but an animalia isn't done just yet, as she points out that she hit Pensilgan with 5 spells. She explains that the doll Pensilgan used tops out at reflecting 5 debuffs and she wonders if Pensilgan has a counter for her next attack. The story continues, in the past we see Rei stalking Rakuro so hard that she runs into a pole. He was always smiling and enjoying himself, so that is why she started thinking about him. She started looking for him and eventually developed elite level stalking skills. She tried talking to him on several occasions, but she was always too shy. Back to the present, Rei won't let her opportunity pass her by, so she comes to Sunraku's rescue. Sunraku is instantly suspicious of this giant knight, and he assumes that they're after the unique scenario just like everyone else. He knows that he needs to think of a way out, and luckily for him it looks like Animalia is preparing to do something. And Animalia's final attack requires the mastery skill and single-digit HP. This chick is just another crazy person in this anime as she explains that her next attack is a murder-suicide curse that destroys her opponent and herself. Pinsilgan has already used her doll and has no way to debuff the spell, so the two of them are eliminated. The attack causes a massive eruption of light, shocking everyone, but this is Sunraku's chance. He tells his bunny little friend to prepare a gate for them and apologizes to the knight for using its head as a launch pet Sunraku runs as fast as he can and the enemy group wants to stop him from reaching the city since it's filled with bounty hunters. Unfortunately for them, Rei is too powerful and knocks them back. Sunraku still doesn't trust a giant knight but promises to remember their name, Sigur Zero. The Azura Kai members are furious but Rei is completely distracted, she can't believe the Sunraku actually talked to her and his apology replays over and over again in her head. The Azura Kai guys see this as an opportunity to earn some fame and make an attempt to attack the attack master. Unfortunately for them, she is furious because they were the reason she couldn't talk to Sunraku more. The Azura Kai members prepare to run away, but Rei doesn't let them, and she still has a lot of anger to take out on them. We then see their Sunraku and Emol have finally made it back to the inn inside of Rabatuza, and Mol ran out of magic from using her transformation earlier, but luckily our MC was prepared and bought magic restoring items ahead of time. Just then Sunraku receives what he calls a sore loser email from Pensilgan. She's in disbelief that the attack master appeared from nowhere to save him, and she points out that her death was her own fault, so she didn't really lose to him. Pinsilgan still wants to talk to Sunraku, so she tells him to call Katso, so the three of them can have a meeting in the game and unite rounds. It's a bit strange and she doesn't just want to talk on SLF, so he is suspicious of her. Just then Katso emails him after he was messaged by Pinsilgan as well. Katso shares Sunraku's skepticism, but they're both also very intrigued by what she might have to say. They decide not to back down, but for now Sunraku has bigger things to worry about. Emol finishes her delicious potion and Sunraku eagerly explains that he is ready to get this unique scenario going. Sunraku wonders what the Mafia Rabbit bus meant by getting him up to snuff, so Emol decide to just show him by taking Sunraku to their arena where they do their most serious battle training. They arrive at the Vorpal Coliseum and Sunraku marvels at how huge it is. Emol reveals that her father slash boss wants Sunraku to fight 10 monsters there. Sunraku was excited for this boss rush type of training and Emol explains that he will be strictly limited to the use of Vorpal weapons. That's totally fine for our MC and he prepares to grind levels until he can wipe the smug smirk off of Pinsildin's face. Sunraku gets a good stretch in before pulling out his Vorpal Blades of Death and has the first monster come out. Our protagonist is pretty realistic, as he doesn't expect to go 10 in a row on his first try. He plans to use trial and error to learn their attack patterns so he can slowly but truly attain victory. He is pretty shocked by his first opponent though, since it's a pack of hounds that always spawn in groups of 5 or more. Their average level is 65, 
so Sanraku wonders if there has been some kind of mistake. His ruthless little bunny friend explains that there's no mistake, and that's just how the first opponent works, Sanraku knows he has his hands full and is instantly wiped out by the pack. Back in the real world, Rei celebrates the fact that Rikuro talked to her and she replays the moment in her mind. That isn't enough for the little stalker though, as she reminds herself to find the courage to send him a friend request the next time they see each other. She wonders if he would accept and imagines our boy saying yes. Ray imagines that they will become friends in real life after that, and this sends her over the roof with joy. The problem is that she searched for him in Third Rima after she was done with the goons but couldn't find him, so she wonders what he could doing. We then see what he's doing as he stares down the hounds, it's pretty clear that these hounds just think of him as food, and Emil points out that this is already Sun Raku's seventh attempt. Thankfully, the penalty for dying isn't applied in the arena. However, it's not just the sheer number of these beasts and their high level that is a huge pain for a big face hero, is their completely synchronized tax. Sun Raka does his best on the seventh try and he realizes that their coordination is the result of having a commander giving orders. He has fought them enough times so he has started to see it, one of these monsters has been howling from a safe distance and never actually fights. Armed with this knowledge, our MC uses his spiral edge attack on the leader, this monster just runs away while the others rush to protect it. Their coordination gets all out of whack, so he knows that he was right. Knowing this, all Sanraku has to do is ignore the others and focus on the commander before he can bark out orders. He hunts down the leader of the pack and he matches for him when he eliminates it, with their master gone there's really nothing left for him to fear, so he wipes out the uncoordinated bunch. Sanraku completes the first level of training and Emol celebrates her bird-faced hero. Sanraku hopes that the next round won't be another group of monsters, and Emol assure him that the next one is definitely a single opponent. He really hopes that's the case, but is shocked when he sees that the next opponent is called the Parasite Tentacle. This hideous creature is just a teddy bear with snakes coming out its back, so this makes Sunraka think that it's practically another group. Sunraka used a hit and run strategy against the beast tentacles. Once all the tentacles were severed, the bear stopped moving and he won, it only took him four tries. A really tough goblin was his third opponent, but it was easier than the previous two, this one only took him two tries. Some wild boar was his fourth opponent, but our MC has some in-game rodeo experience and used that to defeat it on his first try. His fifth opponent was a doozy though, it was some crazy acid pooping bird and this thing took him 112 tries. The next few opponents were relatively easy and only took them one try each. Our hero's ninth opponent was some mega golem, they had some type of invisible energy shield that shipped out 70% of his HP when repelled by it. He eventually figured out that he needed to tear it down little by little, and he defeated it on his seventh try. Our MC more excited than ever as he only has one opponent left, but is pretty upset to see that after all that fighting, he has only gone up two measly levels. This is of course, because of the Vorpal Soul Collar that Flash forced onto him, which generously cuts his experience gains in half. Emol encourages the bird brain to take a break since she has noticed that Sanraku has a terrible look in his eyes. Our hero doesn't think so though and makes a funny looking face, as he states that all the optimization is going great for him. Sunraku demands that the next monster come forward and he is shocked to see that Vash come for a visit. Vash is impressed that Sunraku has already reached the final level and points out that the timing couldn't be any more perfect. Sunraku knows that there was no coincidence as he thinks about how beating the ninth monster just triggered an event flag. Vash explains that for a cross final opponent, he will have him fight a monster that he just caught. Vash really had to go out of the way to get this monster and he sends the chained up beast into the arena. Vash frees the creature and our MC can't figure out what kind of monster it is, he thinks it's some dummy from long ago that tried to fuse with the tree to gain a longer life. Vash observes closely and thus Sunraku can beat this monster in his current state, because of this he changes the win criteria. This monster is apparently insanely strong, so all Sunraku would have to do to win is survive for 5 minutes. This thing is a wood mage, but Sunraku eager to prove that he can complete level. Sanraku was confident for this test of endurance, but is instantly surprised by the monster's first attack. This crazy tree thing creates roots out of nowhere and forces Recruit to run for his life. Vash explains that he is a big fan of Sanraku's confidence, but points out that he will really have to back it up now if he wants to survive. Sanraku is getting pretty stressed evading all of its attacks, and realizes that it's going to be a really long 5 minutes. Out of the over 30 million SLF players Sunraku the first one to fight this terrifying monster. Sunraku wouldn't learn this until far in the future, but we see that this tree mage is an insane level 120. Story continues, Sunraku does his best to avoid all the roots, but they are seemingly endless. 
RMC is crazy as he attempts to close the gap with the monster, even though all he needs to do is survive, getting close doesn't do much though, since Sunraku's attack doesn't even scratch the tree branch wizard. It's pretty clear that physical attacks won't work on it, and Sunraku must now dodge this thing's chains as well. Sunraku realizes that he should just dodge his way to victory, and Emol reveals that one minute has already passed, for minutes remain, so Vash is eager to see Sunraku's Vorpal soul. Sunraku continues to dodge away, but it's getting more difficult, and he realizes that his opponent is an absolute beast. Root Spirit's attacks are almost impossible to dodge since they are intelegraphed, and change that looks like they will destroy anything they come in contact with, as if those things weren't terrifying on their own, they also chase him around like he has a magnet to them. It's almost enough to make him give up on dodging altogether, and Emold becomes increasingly concerned for him, even with all that there's still something worse. This tree monster keeps on spelling magic attacks every now and then, some are electrical and some are fireballs. The more time passes, the more this wooden Harry Potter mixes up its magic types. This time it uses a ice spell attack and Sunraku can hardly manage to survive at all, as the attacks seem to be getting denser as well. The number of chains and roots are increasing and the magic attacks are starting to cover a wider area. The magical tree branch gives a menacing look and Sunraku determines that if the densities of the attacks keep increasing, he will be dead well before he reaches 5 minutes. Just then purple mist erupts from the ground, and it's just another spell from the tree's arsenal that Sunraku has to worry about. The fight is beginning to seem futile, since this thing can nullify physical attacks and constantly adds attacks of its own. Sunraku begins to think that he would have a better chance against the Lycagon that gave him his cars and he really begins to lose hope, he's getting so tired that he can barely even think straight anymore. Sunraku is ready to give up, return home to eat something while he thinks of his strategy and try again later, there isn't really a penalty for losing, so he doesn't really care anymore. Just then Sunraku snaps himself out of it and reminds himself that he is in a pushover, he went through the same feeling of hopelessness against the mud digger when he gave up and had to rely on a mole. Sunraku lets out a battle cry as he is reinvigorated and refuses to let himself cut corners, he thinks that playing so many trash games all his life almost turned his brain into garbage as well but that ends now. Emol and Vash consensus something has changed, and Sunraku makes another push, he states that he has overloaded on Trash Gamium, and he's butted out with God Gamium. Sunraku runs along a route to once again get close to the tree, and promises himself that he don't give up. Vash is impressed that he was able to break through the waves of attacks, to reach mainly range, but says that there really is no point since Sunraku can only dish out basic attacks. Sunraku shocks everyone though, when he kicks the monster staff out of his hand, Sunraku is seriously tired so he's ready to just beat the living tree and goes straight to bed. He realized that even though the monster can nullify physical damage, the attack itself still gets through. Sunraku doesn't let the tree branch cut its staff back, and he wonders what would happen to the tree if it has to fight without it. It's clear that it can't cast its spells anymore, but it still has its roots and chains, something that Sunraku did learn from all his years of gaming is that in a post-apocalyptic world you survive by looting, he uses the snatching skills to learn from Unite Rounds and grabs hold of the staff. Vash and Emol are both impressed, but there's still two minutes left on the timer, and this is the time when Vash wants to see what Sunraku can really do. The tree goes insane and Sunraku realizes that losing the staff must trigger its berserk mode, the attacks are getting more intense, so Sunraku wishes he would have gotten some kind of warning. Little Emol continues cheering on our brave hero, and tells him that he only needs to survive for one more minute. This is exactly where Sunraku mobility build was made for, so there's no way he's going to lose after getting so close. However, one of their chains eventually grabs a hold of him, and just as he expected it applies several debuffs, he won't be able to dodge and the tree wizard is closing in on him. Sunraku sends his staff straight into the sky, causing the tree to go after it instead, the tree finally retrieves it, but Sunraku can't believe that the monster actually fetched it. Sunraku mocks the dumb monster since the little one, if it just kept attacking, but now the time is up, he calls it a wood block head, but it's shocked when the monster just decides to continue attacking. Sunraku runs for his life and pointing out that the flight should be over, luckily, Vash steps in since the 5 minutes are over and completely deletes the monster right out of the game. Sunraku was the winner, and Vash is really impressed by his Vorpal soul. Sunraku can't believe Vash just decimated it and wonders how he was able to land a physical attack on it. 
Vash explains that it can only nullify physical attacks when it has its staff, and without its staff, it's just an animated tree. Emol arrives to celebrate and Sun Raku excited to hear that he will now be getting his reward for completing the quest, Vest declares him an honorary Rabbituzin, but Sun Raku thought winning would come with a rare item or something. Vash removes the Vorpal collar around Sun Raku's neck, officially complaining the unique scenario, and the little rabbits leave, surprisingly, there's a bonus unique scenario called Vorpal Epic. However, Sun Raku just upset that he didn't get a single piece of real loot and log out of the game, it's pretty late, so Sun Raku decides to just get some sleep. The next morning, Sun Raku reads that the recommended level for the bonus unique scenario is 80, but he's only level 31. There is lore behind the quest, but he gave up on reading it all when he was overwhelmed. There are entire clans dedicated to learning all the lore in the game, so it would be very difficult for him to do so on his own. Sun Raku decides to take a break from all the unique scenario stuff, instead he will check out the town and head for the next area. Emol finished this up watering her plants and is ready to move forward as well, Sun Raku realizes that if he goes out looking like he does, then he will surely get mobbed by pikers and info hunters again. Changing his headgear won't be enough either, since Lycagon marks would draw attention too, and Mol proved to be as useful as ever and recommends that he covered his entire form. He has no clue how to do that, but she knows just the place, they go to see a little rabbit named Pete's, who is actually Mol's little brother, he acquires goods and sells them in Rabatuza. He sells in other places as well, but he has to transform into a human to do it so he doesn't do it much. The little bunny calls him a birdman, so Sun Raka proves he is a human by removing his mask, and Maul is shocked that he removed his mask for a moment since, she was sure that he had some deep dark reason for keeping it on all the time. Emol asked about the rare thing that Pete's just found, and he goes looking for it in his inventory. Afterwards we see that this item looks like some kind of bed sheet, and Sun Raka looks like he's wearing a ghost costume on Halloween. They go to get a map for the area around Thirdrima and Sun Raka gets all sorts of weird looks, Moments later, Sun Raka can't hold back anymore and says just how much he hates the bed sheets costume cuts him looking thing. Sun Raka comes down as he realizes that at least he got everything he needed, Sun Raka points out that Emol runs through magic power really fast when in human form, as she chugs down another potion. They need to get moving to the next area and they have three routes they can take, one is the Felfate Caldera, a place where water has collected in the crater of a long extinct volcano to form a lake. The second is the Prismatic Forest Grotto, a maze of caverns overgrowing with plant life. The last route is Iron Ruins of Divinity, ruins from the era of divinity that gets its name from its many hovering iron boards, Sun Raka realizes the seriousness of this decision and tells Emol to quiet down when she recommends going to the Felfate Caldera. Sun Raku decides to go through the prismatic forest and explains his brilliant decision, he declares that they must avoid the ruins of divinity at all costs, because he believes it's a trap. While Sun Raku is busy complimenting his own genius, Emol notice as a person she kind of remembers, watching them. This armored person looks like a creepy stalker and Sun Raku shocked to see who it is. Story continues, we see the ship parked somewhere and we meet the leader of the clan of Shurikai called Orcelot, he is disappointed in his clan for failing him and disgracing their clan. They apologize and blame their failure on the arrival of the attack master, Orcelot doesn't want to hear any excuses though. The secret of a unique scenario was on the line, they should have expected top players to show up. Pensilgan is part of this clan and fearlessly tells Orcelot that he should have just done it himself. He says that he was busy and explains that the rabbit they are after is definitely the key to a bunch of secret stuff. Orcelot wants answers so he tells the group to get them out of Sun Raku by any means necessary, Pensilgan on things that they should be going after unique monsters instead, but Orcelot reminds her that these monsters aren't made to be beatable. As of right now, they're the only ones that know the unique monster spawn condition, players get experience just by encountering the beasts, so if they plan it correctly, they can use it to get way stronger. Everyone agrees not to go after the monster but Pensilgan thinks that they're all useless, Orcelot tries to stop her from leaving, but she has important things to do, Ashurakai was always widely hated on so they decided to thrive on hate. However, the last patch made player killing much riskier, so the clan has changed, Pensilgan can't believe that she's putting her neck on the line for one little NPC, and states that it's a huge gamble for her win or lose. She is willing to sacrifice everything to bury the unique monster, one of the seven colossi called Weathermon the Tomb Guard. Back with our bird-headed hero, Sun Raku was worried that Saiger Zero was there to get revenge for stepping on him, Saiger Zero moves towards them but Sun Raku is terrified and tells Emol that it's time to run, nearby members of Ashurakai are looking for Sun Raku. 
Sanraka runs near them, but they just think he is some crazy dude wearing a bed sheet, unfortunately, player's names hover above their head, so the guys notice that it's Sanraku. They won't be confused by his ghost costume and chase after him, he is causing quite a scene but he doesn't have much of a choice as the knight is following him. Sanraka tells Emol that it's time to head to the next area and the Ashurakai guys determine that Sanraku will be heading to the Iron Ruins, they contact their other members and prepare to have an ambush ready at the exit gate. Emol reminds Sanraku that he said they would be going to the Prismatic Forest Grotto, and he explains that he's going in the wrong direction to fake everyone out. He knows that they will be waiting for him at the gate, but he plans to lose them in an alley, his plan works as they lose sight of Sanraku and decide to just wait at the gate towards the Iron Ruins. Our genius protagonist disguises himself perfectly using his bedsheet and teaches a mole thing or two about deception, they eventually reach their real destination, but are stunned when Sigur Zero appears behind them. Sunraku still thinks the giant knight is a guy and fears the worst, he gets a bit of relief though when Sigur Zero just sends him a friend request. Sigur Zero mumbles that she wants to be friends, but her voice is so low that where Sunraku can't hear a single word. Sunraku begins to wonder if she's a girl, but becomes skeptical, he thinks he might be trying to get his guard down, but realizes that he would have been a goner already if the attack master wanted. Sanraku has some serious trust issues and wonders if she's trying to befriend him, so that he will spill the beans about the scenario. He determines that the giant knight must be plotting something, so she was able to see through his disguise and determine his destination. Sanraku was confident though, since he is a gamer who has been through all kinds of PvP before, he is ready for anything so he plans to play right to her hands and he is certain that he can still beat her. Sanraku accepts the friend request and the little sucker's dream has finally come true, we then see that her finding him was complete luck, but she couldn't be happier. She tells Sanraku that she can help him through the game, but someone has seriously broken Sanraku's trust before, he takes her simple offer as proof that she is trying to get him in her debt, so she can demand information from him. Sanraku declines her offer by saying that he doesn't want to get carried, so she apologizes and emphatically wishes him luck. Sanraku apologizes for using her giant head as a step stool before, but she says it's okay and he can do it anytime. The to say goodbye and Sanraku thinks it's odd how she backed off so quickly, and Mol thinks the knight looks pretty powerful, and Sanraku determines that Sigur Zero is probably around 4 or 5 times stronger than him. Emol says that Sanraku has a stronger Vorpal soul though, but our Birdman has no clue what a Vorpal soul is. Sigur Zero is watches him leave and Sanraku decides to just put the whole encounter behind him, Ray realizes that the girl he was with is an NPC, but doesn't care about anything, when she remembers that where Sanraku finally accepted her friend request. The Ashurakai boys realize that they have been tricked and decide to head towards the Prismatic Forest, they spot the terrifying attack master just standing there though, and decide to run away instead. At the forest our duo can finally relax, so Emol reverts back to being a bunny and our hero goes back to being a bird, the tunnel is covered in glowing moss and Sunraku explains that he has seen tons of things while coming out of tunnels and other games. Guns aimed at him and beautiful shooting stars, however, this amazing forest trumps at all, this site is beautiful and the forest is home to very unique creatures. These include empire work bees and some insects that double as storage, bugs are taking each other out left and right, and Sunraku gets excited as nothing beats entering a new area. Sunraku is a little low on cash from stocking up on items, so he decides to take down one of the storage bugs in hopes of finding a valuable item. He fails miserably though and points out that the insect is pretty light on its wings, despite its gigantic pot belly, it's still too slow for a bird like him and Sunraku destroys it. Luckily, he was right as long as he doesn't damage the stomach, he can snag it as an item, and Mul can't contain her excitement and Sunraku decides that they should keep gathering up as many item drops as they can. Sunraku spots their next prey, and Emol surprised to see that he brought a throwing knife at some point, melee is his only combat option but he got pretty traumatized from getting pooped on by the poop bird in the arena. The throwing knife is a consumable item, but it's a great way to attack from a distance, Sanraku uses the knife to attack a flower, but he knew all along that it was a camouflaged mantis. He demands that it turn into loot for him and he destroys it, and Mul cheers on her hero and Sanraku explains that the mantis are pretty easy to defeat without their camouflage ambushing tricks. 
Sun Rocket checks his inventory to find that he has gotten a ton of loot already, but there's one creature he hasn't defeated yet. Just then, the ground shakes, is that creature just so happens to appear, it's a giant beetle and it's at least 5 meters long, it's drinking tree sap on the Empire Bee's turf, but the bees aren't having any of it. The bees attack the lone beetle and Sun Raku is amazed, since they are clearly following their queen's orders. RMC begins a play-by-play -play of the fight and points out that the beetle is hanging in there, and Mole is next to do some color commentary, but she isn't too good at improvisation. The fierce battle rages on and the beetle uses a torn to attack, while making its way towards the bee's nest, and Mole is finally ready to jump in with commentary, but simply says that the beetle is big. RMC steps up with more intense commentary and points out that the bees have created several weak points in the beetle's arm. The queen bee is just about to command her army to finish the fight, but the beetle shockingly goes straight for the queen. The beetle which is waiting to get into the queen's range and is now victorious, with no leader the rest of the bees scatter and the beetle goes back to munching on its meal. Sun Raku admires the warrior beetle, but this beetle is insane and it goes after them next. They run for their lives and Sun Raku tries to explain that he just wanted to collect the loot that the bees dropped, and Mo points out that the beetle must have thought that they wanted his sap and Sun Raku comes up with an idea. He tosses his stomach sack, causing it to burst on a mantis and the beetle goes after it instead, the tables have turned now, so Sun Raku targets the cracks in the beetle's armor. He lands a ton of critical strikes thanks to his good luck and the once proud warrior beetle is now a pile of nothing. Sun Raku has an inventory full of stuff now, so he put the hold on collecting more. Emol didn't like the idea of exploiting the labor of all the bees, but Sun Raku explains that they live in a buggy bug world. Sun Raku remembers that the area boss there's a spider, and Emol explains it's called the clown spider, there are spider webs everywhere now so Sun Raku assumes that they must be getting closer to the boss. Sun Raku decides to fearlessly enter a cave, but we see that the terrifying spider is waiting for him. Story continues, a quick look into the recent past shows another group, and one girl is terrified that their leader wants to fight the area boss so soon. Their leader tells her to quiet down as he is confident they can win, but this guy just ends up getting stuck on a spider web, the girls become terrified and we see why as they have just encountered the horrifying clown spider. Back to the present, Sun Raku makes his way toward the cave, however, he is not allowed to enter as other players are currently fighting the area boss. The pink-haired guy from earlier comes crashing down and laments how he will have to climb all the way back up again. Pinky is still confident that he can turn this terrible situation around, but he just ends up getting flattened like a pancake. Sun Raku says a prayer for the fallen adventurer and he is ready for his turn now. The innocent little Emol is shocked that he's able to move on so fast, but Sun Raku reminds her that players will just respond right back in 3rd Rima. They make their way into the cave and find the corpses of the poor players that came before for them, Sun Raku show his supreme confidence as he tells Emol to stay back. He plans to beat the clown spider all by himself without dying or taking damage, Emol thinks our boy is absolutely insane but he has already made his decision and he calls out the area boss. The higher up broker who climbs the denser the webs get, luckily he has some new skills after leveling up in the arena. He tries to decide which would be best to use in this situation, but he must quickly turn his attention to avoid a falling boulder, he uses his new skill called One Boat Leap and he's able to easily avoid it. Emol just barely manages to survive and warns our hero to be careful with the webs in front of him, she fears that he will get stuck to them but it's shocked when he doesn't. Our boy is some kind of spider expert as he reveals that horizontal radial lines of spider webs aren't sticky, some more rocks come crashing down but he should be fine as long as he pays attention to where he is stepping. His carefulness combined with an acceleration skill allows him to climb much faster, and Emol is left to dodge falling rocks to save her life. Sun Raku finally comes face to face with the clown spider and dodges a few of its pitiful attacks, Sun Raku then uses a new skill called Loop Slash and slices off one of the spider's legs. That's clearly not enough to win, so he uses a skill called Rush Slash to do way more damage, the ugly spider isn't able to keep its balance so it falls, and Sun Raku determines that falling from this height would deal quite the fall damage. The spider tries to poop out some web to save itself, but our boy should step down instantly with his throwing knife, the spider slams down into the ground and Sun Raku already knows that it won't be enough to end its life. A look at the ceiling shows that this spider has a collection of heavy stuff to drop, so Sun Raku comes up with an idea. The clown spider gets ready for round 2, but our boy has already started dropping boulders and trees to crush the spider. The spider's getting collapsed on and Emol celebrates as it really does seem like her hero will beat the spider uncathed. The spider begins to get up and Emol wonders what our crazy protagonist is doing as he begins to descend. 
It turns out the Sun Raku isn't satisfied by winning this way, since if he can't even beat a mere area boss head on, then he won't be good enough to take down the Lycagon. Sun Raku comes crashing down on the spider to land the critical strike and the area boss completely explodes, and Mole then comes to celebrate as Sun Raku announced the winner. He beat it just like he promised no damage and no death, just then he gets a message from the Pencil Knight but he isn't the only one. Some blonde girl got the message too, she is pretty disappointed since she heard a lot of talk about bosses being tough to solo, but she just did it to the mud digger, this player is actually Katso and she looks forward to something that will actually challenge her. Back at the game shop, Rei excitedly tells Mana that she doesn't have to stalk or sun Raku like a creep anymore because they are friends now, Rei gushes over her crush since he was able to skip past first town and has somehow brought with him an untamable Vorpal bunny. Rei gets excited when she thinks Sun Raku has arrived at the shop, but it's just some random guy. It turns out that Sun Raku hasn't come to the shop in several days, so Mana assumes that he is playing SLF. Sun Raku is a pretty unpredictable guy, so she assumes that he will be the first one to defeat a unique monster. Rei walks home but is stunned when she just so happens to find our boy minding his own business in another store. Rei instantly goes back to her stalking ways and watches him closely. In a magazine Sun Raku reads about his friend Katso's interview, Katso was a pro gamer but also a massive trash talker. Sun Raku also reads that a huge summer update will be coming to SLF, and he thinks about how he just had his meeting with Pensilgan. A look back at the meeting inside another game shows Pensilgan pointing out that it's been so long since her guests have visited, the last time they all saw each other was when they attacked her castle and took on the 80 players guarding it. Her guests Sun Raku and Katso. Those two reminisce about how fun it was to destroy her castle, and they really dig in as they point out how Pentagon is still really butter hurt about it, Pensilgan gets their attention as she has had enough and reminds them that they have business to discuss. She gets right to the point and asks them to team up with her to beat a specific unique monster, Weatherman the Tomb Guard, those two pondered for a moment but then express how shocked they are. It's a unique monster just like the Lycagon where Sun Raku fought so Katso was really interested in unique monster, Pensilgan explains just how serious she is but Sun Raku thought they were just meeting to talk about fighting a high level clan or something. Sun Raku points out that it's just the three of them and wonders if she really thinks they can do it themselves, as he has no clue about this Weathermon monster, Pensilgan explains that Weathermon is not the kind of guy that can be taken down with numbers. She tried with the team of Ashura Kai's 15 best members but they failed, it's the type of monster that gets stronger against more opponents but that isn't all. Pinsilgan then refuses to tell them more until they agree to join her, her plan is to attack two weeks from now, at night right after they push out the massive summer event. Sun Raku thinks it over and wonders why she's asking two players that just started playing the game, when she could just ask a couple of max level players. Pinsilgan seems to be able to read his mind as she explains that their low levels don't matter, what she needs is pure gaming skills. That is why she chose Katso who is a pro gamer and Sun Raku who has godly skills as a trash game player, Sun Raku wonders if their skills are really that comparable and gets upset when his buddy Katso doesn't think so. Pinsilgan just wants their answers and is open to hearing what they would want as an extra reward. Sun Raku says that he understands the situation well, but he can tell that she is still hiding something, he doesn't agree to anything yet and tells her that she needs to tell them her secret, Pinsilgan tells them what it is but we don't get the privilege of hearing it. In the real world, Sun Raku leaves the shop and Rei call out to him from her hiding spot, Sun Raku was caught off guard and just remembers her as being some girl in one of his classes a year ago. Rei awkwardly just stares at him and Sun Raku desperately tries to remember her name, luckily he remembers at the last second and Rei points out how big of a coincidence it is for them to meet there. Our boy was just buying typical gamer supplies and Rei was heading to Juo practice, Rei brings up how Mana told her that he is playing SLF and she tells him how she is playing also. She would like to play together sometime but Sun Raku gets distracted by a message, it's an urgent message from Pensilgan, so he tells Rei goodbye and bless out of there. Rei is just glad that she was able to form some words to talk to Sun Raku, Sun Raku bought so many energy drinks which means he must be planning to have a long gaming session, so she hopes to meet him in game again. At home, Sun Raku loads up SLF and wonders if he should have asked for Rei's in game's name. In the game, Emol greets him a little too closely and Sun Raku reveals that he has something tell her, Sun Raku reveals that he will be fighting Weathermon the Tomb Guard in two weeks, and he is thinking over removing Emol from the party during that time. Emol absolutely loses her mind after hearing the name Weathermon and instantly rushes off to go tell her mafia boss father, Sun Raku has no clue what that was all about but has no time to find out since he needs to meet with Pensilgan. 
Look back at their meeting, shows the Sunraku asks Pinsildin about bringing along Imol who is an NPC, Pinsildin is of course familiar with the little bunny and tells him that if he really cares about Imol then he should take her off his party. She then shockingly reveals that an SLF once an NPC dies, they won't get respond. Story continues, we see that Emol's father has some Sunraku to hear his plan straight from his mouth. He wants to know if it's true that Sunraku plans to pick a fight with the one known as the Death Defire. Sunraku instantly realizes that the sudden event must be important. The best tactic he can use right now to talk to this mafia boss is to role play in this scenario and its characters. If he does it right, he might get some valuable information about Weathermon, Sanraku determines that he must persuade Vash to get on his side and the key will be to use the word Vorpal Soul. Vash minds Sanraku that he is too weak to take on Weathermon, Sanraku dramatically reveals that he isn't taking on this challenge because he thinks he can win, he explains that he will only be acting as a support as his teammate will be doing most of the fighting, Sanraku explains that a group of murderers are taking advantage of Weathermon for selfish gain. They rack up tons of experience just by encountering him over and over again, Sanraku's teammate is the defector of this group and she wants to end the fight once and for all. Sanraku explains that she has taken every measure to assure victory but Vash counters that it doesn't matter how many measures they take, if they aren't strong enough then they're just going on a mission of self-destruction. Death missions are not what having a Vorpal soul is all about and Vash taught him better than that, Sanraku has no intention of losing and explains that he and his friends simply want to support their leader's will to win against Weathermon. Sanraku explains that coming to her aid is really just upholding his own Vorpal soul, he tells Vash that all he needs is two weeks. Two weeks for Vash to take Sanraku, who acknowledges he's an inexperienced fool and turns him into a worthy challenger against a strong foe. Vash seems to get convinced as he begins talking about honor, he states that a certain man is very awkward and Sanraku wonders if he is talking about Weathermon. This man is overly serious never knowing when to stop, he lost his wife over a little lie and because of that he is cursed with an undying body, he is now just a walking corpse unable to even put himself to rest, for that reason someone needs to beat him down and put him to sleep. Vash swear not to lay upon this man himself, but since Sunraku was so insistent then he won't stop him. On top of that Vash even has his beloved daughter insisting, Vash then tells Sunraku follow him as he agrees to give him a hand, Sunraku was then shocked when they arrive at a blacksmith's forge. He celebrates for a moment as he did a good job in getting to the next stage of the Rabatuza event, Vash calls upon the blacksmith named Bilak, who is also another one of Emol's siblings. That's already three kids so far. So Sanraku wonders if all the bunny is in Rabatuza, all Vash's children. Sanraku is introduced and Bilak says he looks just like a person named Evil. Vash takes a look at Sanraku's Vorpal weapons and is glad to see that Sanraku was accepted by his weapons nicely. Vash states that he will be ascending the weapons, but Bilak is shocked to hear that, she can't believe that Vash will be wielding the hammer himself, but Vash explains that he must. If Sanraku was going to take on the Death Defire, he can't just sit there and do nothing about it, Bilak becomes extremely excited and goes to get the forge started. Vash asks Sanraku if he has any good materials that he got after a difficult battle so Sanraku searches through his inventory, he eventually finds something and hands Vash a quad beetle shell, it was able to withstand the Empire Bees for a really long time so it should be good material, Vash agrees and gets himself ready. Bilak explains that Sanraku should consider himself very lucky since her boss has not held a hammer in several years, the last time was even before he became the king of rabbits. Emol reveals that Vash is actually a skilled blacksmith and he is not an ordinary one either, his expertise some forging, allows him to call himself a master craftsman and his know-how on Age of Divinity's forgery makes him an ancient craftsman. As a master of both he is a divine craftsman, the supreme blacksmith second to none, and Mo becomes excited as her father's ready to begin. Vash hammers away at Sunraku's weapons and Sunraku is surprised to see magic circles appear, they pop out with every strike and are then absorbed into the weapon. Bilak reveals that ascending involves reading the memories and experience that weapons earn in battle, remolding them into what they are meant to be, put differently it's a technique that ascends weapons to their true form. Weapons with Vorpal in their name remember battles against strong opponents, Vash is taking their memories of fighting Sunraku's hand and the power of the Shuenfu instilled in the material he gave Vash. He then mixes those two elements together to change the weapon's form, Bilak points out the Sunraku fought the like again evenly so she can't wait to see what weapon will result from that. Vash begins to sing and Sunraku must be told to quiet down as this is a very important moment, the little rabbits are not to witness the master at work and Vash just keeps wailing on the weapon. 
After some time, Bash finally proclaims that the Verbal Choppers have acquired their true form and name, they are now the Moonblade Waxing and the Moonblade Waning Weapons. There are two swords from one blade and only when they are paired together will they show their true value. Sun Raku is of course excited about this amazing feat and immediately goes to check their stats, for the waxing one when used in a battle with a higher level enemy, it decreases the wielder's HP upon landing a critical hit. However it also applies a damage bonus to his next attack, as for the waning blade, it restores HP under the same condition, this makes it clear that the blades really do complement each other. Sun Raku then reads that a fusion gauge will be filled up after landing several critical strikes. Sun Raku can't believe how awesome that is, since it means that the blades can fuse together. Sun Raku wants to try them right away but sadly finds that he has insufficient stats to equip them. Sun Raku calms himself down from the disappointment as he realizes that it's a simple math problem. The required stats are 150 and he is currently at 57, players get 5 points per level. Sun Raka gets really depressed as he realizes that this means he will need to be level 50 before he can use them. The others try to console him but it's no use as he wanted to use his sweet new weapons now. In third Rima Sun Raku arrives late to his meeting with Penciledon and Katso. They are furious since he is and it's a little late, as they have been waiting for 3 hours. Sun Raku explains that he was busy with that unique scenario and kept going in it because Weathermon came up. Penciledon agrees to let him off the hook for being late as long as he reveals any information he received. Katso can't believe it and Sun Raku points out how bold Katso is for selecting the blonde girl as his avatar. Katso states that he doesn't need pointers on character design from the guy who looks like a bird and calls him an infamous criminal. Penciledon intentionally had to pick a place for the meeting that had low traffic because Sun Raku has so many people coming after him. Sun Raku then catches them up on everything he learned about Weathermon the Tomb Guard. Katso wonders if they are dealing with some kind of undead monster and Penciledon recalls that Weathermon's movements did seem a bit janky, she assumed he was a cyborg type but being undead makes more sense. Penciledon strangely states that she has something to take care of and instructs them to me later that night, she also instructs them to grind experience in the iron ruins in the meantime and gives them a fishing rod and a map. The guys have no clue how the items are supposed to help, but Penciledon reveals that it will all make sense when they get there. Penciledon prepares to leave but she notices the strange little bunny on Sun Raka back. She noticed something was strange the second Sun Raka walked in and wondered if he really thought that the disguise was really working. Sun Raka does his best acting job as he acts clueless to what she is talking about and simply explains that he's just following the latest fashion trend. Penciledon is then shocked to see that he did manage to fool at least one person as Katza wonders what the fashion trend is, Penciledon decides to drop the issue and just leaves. The two guys excitedly get ready to do some grinding but Sun Raku must take a moment to find the safest route, Katza was all hyped up but gets discouraged since he now has to sneak around to since he is with Sun Raku. Emol gets distressed as she reveals to Sun Raku that she's getting a serious earache and would like to move around for a bit, Katso finally realizes that something is off and becomes startled when he sees that Sun Raku's equipment is talking. The jig is up so Sun Raku lets Emol free and he states that he was just trying to see how long it would take for Katso to notice, Katso realizes that it's the NPC from the unique scenario, as he takes a closer look he wishes he had one but Sun Raku tells him to get his own. The guys finally arrive at the entrance to the ruins and Sun Raku explains that he wants to get to level 50 as soon as possible, Katso reveals that this is his first time in a party and it's actually the first Sun Raku has party with another player as well. They reach the entrance to the Iron Ruins of Divinity and they both become excited as it clearly has a different vibe than the rest of the game. Story continues, we see into the past as our group has a little strategy meeting. Penciledon explains that at the start of battle Weathermon activates a skill, it sets the max level of all characters in the area except for him to level 50. The boys are shocked as the Weathermon is an insane level 200, this is why their levels don't really matter against him and player's skill is key, the guys are still pretty new to the game so they at least need to grind to level 50. Back to the present, the two guys enter the Iron Ruins of Divinity, they search for a hidden area that is perfect for grinding that Penciledon told them about but it's taking longer than expected to find it. It's like a whole different game compared to outside of the ruins and black panels are sliding around all over the place. Sun Raku always the trash game player points out that they could probably do some real cool stuff if they glitch out the platforms, Katso knows his friend well and tells him that he needs to wash away all the trash game stuff in his brain. 
This place reminds Katso of a god-tier sci-fi game but Sunraku just wants to know what level he is, Katso reveals that he's level 25 and Sunraku mocks him for still being in the 20s. Sunraku is level 31 so Katso quick to point out that they aren't that far apart, and Mol unintentionally roasts Katso as she explains that Sunraku was just worried about how weak and frail he is, just then Emol warns the boys to be careful as some big thing called the giant suppression dome almost crushes them. It's clearly an enemy but Katso comfortably tells Sunraku to sit this one out, and Mol wonders if Katso really okay but Sunraku confident in his friend's abilities. Katso prepares to fight and explains that no matter how low a level you are SLF lets players stand a chance with skill alone, he destroys the drone with just one punch and pressing his teammates. Katso explains that the red glowing on his hands is a spell that gives bonuses to strength and vitality, more enemies appear and he goes on to explain that he selected a spirit fist user monk. He cannot equip weapons but in exchange he can give himself buffs and beat things down with his fists, as for his build he put most of his stats into HP and vitality. Katso finishes up destroying the enemies and can tell Sunraku's build is just by knowing him, Katso guesses that Sunraku was a glass cannon with the strength and agility focus. He is partially right but Sunraku corrects him as he is a luck and agility focused fighter, Little Emol corrects him even further and explains that Sunraku has a vorpal soul but still nobody knows what that is. They continue on their long journey following their precise instructions on the map that Pencil Dawn gave them, it has them go in several directions and through many rooms. They are all amazed by the person who made the map since it must have required a lot of patience, the final instructions are to jump down a hole but they pause as they wonder if it's some kind of prank to make themselves end life. Katso doesn't want the glass cannon Sunraku to instant die going down there so he takes the lead, and Mol says that Katso won brave lady but Sunraku tries to explain that Katso was actually a guy. Katso tells them to come down because Sunraku loser while doing so, Sunraku gets furious and jumps down ready to get some revenge, he quickly forgets the insult however when he sees that they have arrived at the hidden area. According to Pencildone's instructions, they will be able to fish up a monster called the Lifestyle Lake Serpent in the lake, Katso wonders if they will really be able to catch anything with their puny little rods but they decide to give it a try. The two friends are super competitive and decide to compete to see who can catch more, Sunraku's father used to take him fishing all the time, so he knows all the tips and tricks. Sunraku quickly gets a bite but Katso points out that it probably has more to do with all his luck, Sunraku only manages to get a salmon but everyone is shocked when Katso pulls out his giant serpent. The lifestyle lake serpent is a powerful beast so Sunraku decides that it's time to unveil his new weapon, Katso reminds Sunraku that he's too low of a level to equip the moon blades, but seeker Sunraku reveals that he had more weapons made, these are called the empire between blades. The serpent begins attacking and Emol explains to Katso that she had her sister make these blades for Sunraku. A look back shows the little bunny completing the blades made from the empire bequeen material Sunraku brought her. Bilak get upset when Sunraku almost forgets her name, so he realizes that he might have to manage affection levels with rabbits other than Emol and Vash, Sunraku panics as he starts getting traumatizing flashbacks from a trash game dating simulator. In that dating simulator, he had to balance the affection levels of a bunch of different girls, if he made the slightest mistake, he will get the bad ending where all the girls move to Italy to apprentice at a pizzeria. His character named Sanraku Picklefish would have his adolescence crushed beneath a pizza stone. Sunraku quickly snaps out of his depression and compliments Bilak on making his new blades, she reveals that his right hand blade has a special attribute. We then watch as he puts it to work against the serpent, the guys do their best against it but they struggle. Their levels are just too low to put more than a scratch on the creature. Sunraku explains that some weapons, skills, spells and monster attacks have a corrosion attribute, if enough damage is dealt to a certain part of an avatar, it'll cause visible damage and create a weak point there. Bilak explained that his right hand weapon doesn't corrode in the normal way, it infects the part Sunraku attacks and corrodes it over time more like a corrosive poison, with the corrode attribute building up and warming its way in little by little. If he keeps stealing more corrosive poison with repeated strikes, it breaks through the enemy's debuff resistance and causes the corrosive attribute to show itself faster. 
Sun Raku finally manages to create a weak spot so Katza focuses all his strength to attack it, they finally manage to hurt the thing so Emol wants to join the fight. The serpent quickly targets her and Sun Raku can't get to her in time, but Katso jumps in to take the hit instead. Luckily Katso survives because he built himself like a tank. Katso stuns the serpent, so they all combine their power to attack the beast and they finally win the fight. The fight was definitely worth it as it gave a lot of experience and the boys are already starting to level up. Katso goes up 4 levels and unlocks a bunch of skills, he wonders if he can link the skills but Sun Raku assumes that he's mistaking SLF for a different game. Sun Raku doesn't even know what skill linking is, but Katso was certain it must be possible since SLF is a game all about skills, Katso explains that he should have learned that in first Hia but Sun Raku skip right past that starter town. Katso then explains that skills with proficiency levels can be linked up at a facility called the Skill Garden that lets them create new combo skills. Sun Raku now realizes why some of his skills were changing names, since that just meant that they could now be linked. There is a lot more that can be done at the Skill Garden so Sun Raku freaks out after not knowing any of it. Katso then mentions sub-jobs and guilds which makes them freak out even more since he missed so much from just skipping one little town. Sun Raku decides that he won't get anywhere by being depressed and decides to continue grinding. Sometime later the boys regroup with Pencil Dawn, she is happy with their progress as Katso is now level 40 and Sun Raku level 42. That's a lot of progress in such a short amount of time so they're ahead of schedule, Katso tries to explain how little Sun Raku knew about stuff but Sun Raku him down. Katso was pretty impressed with Emol's power and Sun Raku reveals that his precious little bunny friend is already level 56. They're still pretty pressed for time overall, which is why Pencil Dawn had to use an expensive tent that double as a safe point. Pencil Dawn then reveals that it's time for them to go meet someone and this hour of night is the only time they can do it, this person is a unique NPC named Setsuna and they need to speak to her in order to fight Weathermon. Elsewhere in the night, we see this Setsuna person as she sings by a tree. That brings the episode to an end. Thanks for watching, want next part subscribe the channel and turn on notification bell.